The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. He's my usual co-host. And it is a post-62 home run edition of Tim Graham and Friends. Aaron Judge uh, tonight hit number 62 against the Texas Rangers to finally end that quest. I was starting to think he wasn't going to get it. Um, And I was rooting against it, quite frankly, because... Uh, Even though I'm not a huge record preservationist, uh, I do believe there's a certain romance to some stats. And 61 home runs by Roger Maris was just one of those. Um, Yeah, I I wasn't broken up about some of the other ones because we knew that there were steroids involved and you can kind of dismiss those uh, almost out of hand. We can have a conversation about that if you want, Jonah. I don't know what your thoughts are on, on Aaron Judge. Uh, you know, I, and I, I think he's a fine player. But here's the one thing, though, just to set the table for this discussion on 62 home runs. I see a lot of sentiment on social media, on broadcast, highlight packages, whatever, about the idea that this is the real home run record because Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa uh, were linked to steroids and have admitted to varying degrees or been caught in, in court documents and et cetera, et cetera. All the reasons they're not in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, a lot of people don't want to say that those are the real home run records. Uh, but here's Aaron Judge finally breaking the pure home run record. But do we know for sure that Aaron Judge is clean? I mean, he hasn't tested or, any, or anything like that, but I mean, if, if Aaron Judge two years from now were to test positive, would we be stunned by this? I mean, is no, I don't, I don't think we can assume any athlete in any sport is 100% clean. It's just been shown so many times. And the nature of how performance enhancing drugs do help athletes, and also the athletes are usually ahead of the curve, ahead of the testing. Now, I'm not accusing Aaron Judge of taking any steroids. And if you ask me, I don't think he has because he no me neither, but I, I'm 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 more different. Right. Let me clarify before we keep going further because I don't want people to listen to this and saying, what the fuck is Graham talking about here? What I mean is the statements that are being made as though uh, we know for sure. You know, it's like, well, finally, a, a pure uh a legitimate breaking of this record. There's nothing to say that oh. this is a hundred. We can't anymore. And that's a that's the fault of Major League Baseball for having let the steroid scandal and the steroid era go on so long under the covers is that we are now left for the rest of our lives to wonder uh, whether it's legit or not. Well, we didn't really know about Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa and Barry Bonds at the time. It was, there was more suspicion. There was the stuff with the Andro Barry Bonds. I think a lot of people noticed his dramatic weight gain and some people had more suspicions, but those home run chases were fun at the time because we really didn't know. We didn't know enough about, steroids in the game and the extent of it and some of the details, the Belco case comes later on and it made it more fun. I'm, I'm kind of glad, you know, that was a lot of fun watching the 1998 home run chase. And I think people forget how cool it was watching Barry Bonds, Jack 73 home runs into McCovey Cove. And uh, not everybody liked that he broke Hank Aaron's record, but it was compelling to watch. And I think Aaron judge home run chase. I think I'd want to reiterate that I don't think he's on steroids because, you know, this could get misconstrued. But the point I wanted to make here. is I didn't think Fernando Tatis was on steroids either. And, and there's a lot of baseball players. There's some baseball players that do get uh, – we don't know what performance enhancing drugs they're taking, but they do get suspended, and some of them have bailed excuses and some of them don't. And, and we so, do see on the various documentary shows, whether it's HBO's Real Sports or uh, 
ESP E60 on ESPN or, or what have you, how easy it is to skirt around uh, steroid testing or performance enhanced uh, PED testing. And sometimes you get caught by being stupid because you're not, you're not getting around. You're not, you don't know how to fool it the right way. Um, same thing in, in the national football league with the drug testing. Um, it, it's yeah. not, it's not steroids is certainly system. not out of the game or any of these games. And if you follow certain sports, um, you know, fighting and wrestling and bodybuilding, powerlifting, CrossFit. I mean, steroids are probably being used more than ever. They're getting a little bit closer to being legal in a lot of ways and in some ways more socially acceptable. Movie stars take steroids to make their body transformations and extend their youthfulness. So I, while I'm not, I don't really want to accuse any player of cheating. I think that steroids are still involved in performance enhancing drugs are still involved in all of these sports. And we can't assume that anybody's clean. We probably should assume everybody's taken a little bit of something. It might be certain legal supplements that work some of the same ways, but you know, every professional athlete looks like a professional bodybuilder now. And that wasn't the case when Babe Ruth and Roger Maris were hitting home runs. But it was the case, I guess, with, you know, 1998 and Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire and things like that. Jose Canseco, you know, this goes back quite a long time, but not all the way back to Mickey Mantle and Hank Aaron and the legends like that. Yeah. I think that that's where some of the romanticism comes in, but um, yeah, I think that the home run record uh, in major league baseball is a sacred number and 755 for Hank Aaron and 61 for Roger Maris to me it held that romantic feel. Uh, and there aren't a lot of numbers that are like that. I can't tell you Cy Young's win total, uh, whatever it was. I, I just never have memorized that type of thing. I don't know what the RBI record is. Uh, I don't know what the greatest ERA uh, of all time is, uh, but I know 755 and 61. Uh, and for me, it was just a, a little bittersweet um, to see uh, Aaron Judge break Roger Maris's record because that was a throwback to um, you know when you knew the record was legit just because that stuff didn't exist. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, their performance enhancing drugs, uh, you know, may have been, you know, something else that was concocted in a, in a chemist lab, but, uh, I, there was no, there, there was no, uh, you know, history of anything like that until, until the eighties or the late seventies, really, you know, you started to see, uh, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers teams, the steel curtain teams, and the stories that we've heard about those guys. And, um, in the you Russians know, in the Olympics. Right. I was just going to say the East Germans uh, at the 80 Olympics, you know, things like that. But in 1961. Uh, so anyway, there's just something about that uh, record that I that I was hoping didn't fall. But I, I think it's still cool. I was watching every at bat, every Yankees game uh, for the last two weeks. I've been tuning in and I've been thankful that we live in uh, a region where you get the Yankees games. Uh, you didn't have to go looking for it. We could just turn on the Yes Network or when the game was on ESPN or Fox, and we knew we were going to be able to watch Aaron Judge's at bats uh, here in Western New York, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, now that he's gotten 62, hell, I hope he gets 66, although there's only uh, one game left on Wednesday. Um, but, yeah, get hot and, and obliterate the record now that he has it. Um, but well, I, I guess thought just it was fun watching him struggle a little bit. And I'm not old enough to remember Roger Maris in 1961, but I've seen the movies and read stories about it and him losing his hair and stressing out about it. And not to say I was rooting against Aaron Judge, but it was the drama was a little bit fun to watch him not hit home runs for a few games here. Yeah, while also maintaining the triple crown race. Uh, so he wasn't hitting home runs, but he was still getting on base and you had to watch his batting average. Yeah, it's an incredibly entertaining uh, last few weeks of the major league season, usually at a time when only the fan bases of a handful of teams are really paying attention because of uh, you know the, the pennant race or uh, uh, your seeding into the playoffs, for instance, Mets fans and, and Braves fans. But Aaron Judge's story, whether it be his triple crown or the 62 home run chase, uh, was a national story that really uh, was good for baseball, and and it still is is good for baseball. And how about Albert Pujols? Which it wasn't the same situation with like McGuire and Sosa or Mantle and Maris chasing the record together, but it was two home run chases going on concurrently, and that made it a little bit more fun. September is not always the most fun month of the baseball season, but there was a lot of that this this month. <laughs> 
Yeah, Pujols, uh, the question for me uh, that was raised, I don't know, a month ago was what if he gets to 699? Does he come back for another season? Because he'd already said that this was his last, but to come one home run shy of such a milestone, uh, I was thinking to myself, man, that would be a tough, tough decision or a tough spot to be in for a guy. Uh, because if he does want to come back uh, to get 700, he's still going to have to uh, train as though he's playing another full season. Even if you say he's going to hit his five home runs and retire or whatever, if the, if the Cardinals wanted him to do that, I don't know, but, um, but then he just totally annihilates the barrier uh, and got hot. And that was a great story too, uh, to get this way past 700 comfortably past 700. Um, Jonah, what's your thought on the, on the home run record? Just before we change topics here, uh, what is the home run record? The single season home run record? Yes. 73. I mean, he hit the ball out of the park 73 times. I don't care what other mitigating factors went on. That's the record. Roger Maris had the record. Babe Ruth had the record before. You can stratify them in certain ways, especially with the number of games played with Babe Ruth. You can talk about the era and the context and how much easier it was to hit home runs. And I think that's, I might have a slightly more nuanced argument about the career home run record in a way, even though Barry Bonds holds that, but that, that seems a little bit more tainted to me. I don't know why. There was just the way the game was played. They weren't against the rules. A lot of players were on steroids. Pitchers were on steroids. And, you know, Barry Bonds had the best hitting seasons of all time. He Bottom did. Line. He did. Um, I'm With willing to. I mean, there's ways you can be era specific and still think the Babe Ruth record is the ultimate home run record. But. The most home runs ever hit were by Barry Bonds. Mark, Mark right. Boyd, Babe Ruth didn't play a 162 game season. So how many home runs would have he, he would he have hit and hit with uh, a few more games? Not only from a career standpoint, but in that season that he hit 60. Um, and Babe Ruth swing was like swinging a solid oat bat, and the ball was probably made of lead. I mean, maybe the pitching wasn't as good, but like <laughs> there's a lot of mitigating factors for all of these seasons and all of these records and the baseballs and the baseball bats and the parks and the rules and the height major of the league mound. baseball cha- making it a home run ball versus a pitcher's ball. Sure. And they, and they seem to be able to shift that not only season to season, but week to week, you know, there's been talk about it where, you know, the baseballs have changed. So the major league baseball says we'll change them back. Uh, and it's not even really a secret, but you um, can dispute all of Babe Ruth's records by saying there were no black players allowed in the majors at that time. So there's absolutely a lot of ways to, uh, Slice the apple here. I don't know. That's, that's not really the metaphor I'm looking for. Slice the skin the cat. Yeah, but I don't skin cats, so I don't use that metaphor. But like, there's you know, there's a lot of angles you can argue, and I think the there's a lot of ways to wax the dolphin. Sure, baseball is a very mathematical game, and the math says Barry Bonds hit 73 home runs, and I don't even know how many career home runs, 700 whatever, to break Hank Aaron's record, and those are the records. And somebody else breaks them, then they have the record. Uh, you know, you just can't deny it's the same with teams that get, uh, you know, NCAA sanctions and they take the wins away. They take the banners down. No, those teams won the games. They won the championships. Nothing changes because they broke a rule. But those do change though, Jonah, you look in the record books and they're vacated, but they didn't change. We watched the games. We know who won. You can't say the team that lost is the champion or won the games all the all-time wins, it's a fake number for everybody involved if we're just taking them away arbitrarily. The games were played, the wins were recorded in the book, the losses were recorded in the book, the box score has the home runs in them. But then the book changes. Can't the book be changed? Not the agate page, not the box score that gets printed in the first draft of history. The NCAA changes the page all the time. The NCAA makes you take down your banners. Sure, but that doesn't change who won the championships. I mean, I think that takes away the credibility of the NCAA record books when they pick and choose in different ways. And baseball doesn't quite do that, but they did it with the asterisks with Roger, Mar- Roger Maris in a little bit of a way and not putting these players in the Hall of Fame, not acknowledging the great baseball players that they were because of one rule that wasn't in the rule books that they broke when other players are in the all sorts of Hall of Fames and broke all sorts of rules. And other than Pete Rose, you know, he's the only other one held to this Fakakta standard. <laughs> well, gambling's not the same as, as performance enhancing drugs. Well, P- Pete Rose had more hits than anybody that's ever played the game of baseball. 
they should name the Hall of Fame after him in some way. So he should be like the first guy in the door if we're redrafted this. But he's well, not allowed in because he's got a gambling problem. Like, come on, he didn't. Well, it's a bunch of different things at this point. It was the gambling, and then it was the lying about it. And now every time he comes back, there seems to be some other thing that's brought up from his past. It's the however old the girl was. She was 15, and he thought she was 16 or something, so that made it all right or whatever it was. The story that happened a couple of months ago when uh, he came back to Philadelphia and was allowed by, for that reunion uh, yeah, of that World Series team. Who had the hits record before Pete Rose? Was it Ty Cobb? Ty Cobb, yeah. Uh, what did he do? Let's go over his uh, back <laughs> of his baseball card here. Right. Well, I I hear you. I hear you. I don't. I don't. I just don't see it as black and white as you do. I guess it's the Hall of Fame, not the Hall of Virtue. I feel the same way about O.J. Simpson being on the Wall of Fame, although the large display in the stadium is a little bit of a different thing. But actually, being a name on the list of the wall of fame members or the all-time Buffalo Bills. He absolutely has to be included in that. And I feel the same about all the hall of fame players in all the oh. sports. I really don't think some of these other factors. Well, I mean, you could say players cheated and that their records are illegitimate, but for a lot of these baseball players, you have to adjust with that context in mind, Mark McGuire, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, there should be first ballot hall of fame. Maybe not. Well, Mark McGuire is, is, I mean, his numbers are, are, don't make him an automatic Hall of Famer, but they sure do. You know, the numbers for Roger Clemens and, and Barry Bonds speak for themselves. Rafael Palmero uh, has both 3,000 hits and 500 home runs, which used to be each, each one was an automatic uh, qualifier to get you into the Hall of Fame. By the way, Jonah, your microphone keeps banging on your zipper on your fleece. Sorry about that. So you'll need to, so when you, when you talk, it kind of cl it clicks on your, the zipper, your microphone there. There you go. Oh, That'll probably help. But it's it. this? I, yeah. That right there. This is uh, when we miss Bobby Rosati, when someone says banging on your zipper, <laughs> I don't know. I might have to turn this around. All right. Well, can you hear me while I'm while you're doing that? No. Are you going to edit that out? No, we're going to leave that in. Are you not wearing anything underneath your fleece? Is that the thing? Is that why you have it zipped I'm up? Not. So high? If you want to know the truth, I've only been wearing these Nike tech fleece outfits with no other garments because I'm having trouble moving my arms and my legs. And it's been hard to put certain, uh, you know, Clothing you and it's a perfect time to bring this up. You are going to be on steroids starting tomorrow. Yes. Well, how many home runs do you think I'm going to hit from my five day steroid regimen? Just in time for the postseason. Exactly. Yep. So you've been uh, homebound for a few days. You've been, been covering the, as best you can. You did get out to blitz. the the Canisius at Lancaster uh, instant classic game of the year, game of the decade. But you weren't able to make it to UB football, a, a big victory against Miami. So I don't know if you want to give people an update as to what you're dealing with here. Or... Yeah, I didn't. Here, pull your the... pull the collar, pull the the lapel of your fleece. Just yank, pull it to the right. Yeah, just pull it out there, and then maybe you'll move it away from your microphone. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come. back. It keeps but... clacking on it. Here, does this help? I could do this the whole podcast. Sure, that's fine. Yeah, this is what I'll do. People, I, people do this. I see people that do podcasts. They hold that you're actually coming in clearer. Yeah. Yeah. This is a technique I've learned in my three weeks as a multimedia journalist, but I'm on the disabled list slash working from home. I covered the UB game on UB football on Saturday. They won their two and oh in the Mac for just the fourth time in 24 years. And those other three seasons, they went to a bowl game each of those three times. But I did it from home. I didn't go to the Sabres preseason game tonight. I would have if I was able to, but I'm not really able to. I wanted to cover it off TV, but I'm not able to because I don't get the MSG network. And I was just unable to figure out how to watch that online. But I monitored it through the stats and all of our good friends on Twitter. Sabres win four and one in the preseason. But anyways, because <laughs> that was a side track. I haven't been able to move one of my legs and one of my arms pretty well since started a little bit on Friday. I think I said on the podcast, I was a little bit feeling under the weather Saturday and Sunday. I couldn't leave my apartment. I've been using crutches to get around. I'm feeling a bit better now 
from taking a lot of ibuprofen. Tomorrow I go on steroids. Next year I hit 73 home runs, but we'll get into that later. With an asterisk, though. Sure. But don't know what it is. Haven't gotten the test results back yet. Hoping it's just a virus and some weird symptoms and reactions. Could be all sorts of, you know, worrisome outcomes, but I'm trying not to worry about that until the doctor tells me I tested positive for lupus or whatever the hell it is. Well, good luck with everything. Hopefully you start feeling better and the steroids help you. Well, it's helped that UB won and the Bills won and the Sabres are winning the preseason on their way to winning the Stanley Cup and Aaron Judge hit his 62nd home run. I mean, where else would you rather be than right here, right now, trapped in your apartment, watching all these great sports moments, except the ones that are on MSG Network. And I don't get Yes Network either. So really just been monitoring these things on social media and then the highlights afterwards. Well, you're going to have to invest perhaps into a different package. I get ESPNU. I was able to watch UB on the, you know, the fourth most important ESPN channel. And I don't know if that's true. I think they might even think that ESPN three is more important than ESPNU. Oh, I think ESPNU. Well, no, I think ESPNU is it's on real TV and ESPN three is on the internet. Yeah, but ESPN3 just has way more offerings and you have to pay for it. So I think probably in if you were to ask ESPN's executives, they probably value ESPN3 more than ESPNU. That's like their that's their receptacle. It's like where they throw all the things that they don't know what to do with. How about this? I don't get ESPN3. I do get ESPN Plus and I get ESPNU. So I just feel like they're right. Don't you get ESPN3 if you have ESPN Plus? You would think, but I don't, because when I try to watch an ESPN3 game, at least a local game, on my ESPN Plus, it says blacked out. I don't have permission because my YouTube TV cable doesn't get that channel. Maybe if I log out and log back in, but I just don't. I don't know how that works. Maybe Scooter Vertino can come on and tell me how to watch all these things, even though it's a competing network. But I feel I'm like sure he knows he, the technology. Yeah, he would know. He knows the business. Um. Let's talk about head injuries and what's going on in the NFL uh, because it's a hot one topic and uh, neither of us seem to at the moment. Uh, I am not in protocol. You are not in protocol. That does not mean, though, based on what we've seen uh, lately, that we don't have concussions because maybe the spotters has, have missed it. Uh, but uh, with what happened with Tua Tagovailoa uh, against the Bills uh, two Sundays ago and what then happened on Thursday night, with uh, Tua suffering uh, another head injury. Um, Cameron Brait on Sunday Night Football, we saw it with uh, Isaiah McKenzie uh, entering concussion protocol uh, for the Bills and their comeback victory over the Ravens on Sunday. Um, you know, I think that this is one of those moments, and, I, and we've, uh, we've seen it from the NFL at times, where there is going to be a massive overcorrection and we are going to probably see not a gradual or subtle change in how the NFL handles head injuries, but probably a pretty dramatic one uh, in relatively soon uh, during the season. It's not as though they're going to institute new policies for 2023 or convene and pass something at the owners meetings uh, in May or anything like this. Um, the NFL has said that it is going to tighten up its concussion protocols. It's going to add new layers of uh, checks uh, to the system, most notably if you have gross motor. Uh, um, I'm not exactly sure what the what the exact phrasing was. Gross motor um, malfunction or whatever, which is what we saw with Tua Tagovailoa not being able to stay on his feet, um, that you come out of the game and you are put into concussion protocol and maybe you're able to get past the, uh, the screenings in other ways by fibbing your way through it, by talking your way through it, or by crazy things that happen with head injuries where they don't necessarily show up. Uh, there are people slipping through the clack, uh, cracks left and right. And even with the hypervigilism uh, that we saw since uh, Tua's uh, injury on Thursday night, we saw Cameron Brait, as I mentioned before, on Sunday night, slipped through the cracks. The spotter did not see that he had uh, had a head injury uh, or that needed to be uh, taken off the field until uh, there were other symptoms that showed themselves uh, on the sideline uh, for the rest of the game. So that, I guess you can say that the system eventually worked uh, when it came to Cameron Brait, but 
there was a chance that uh, it was it wasn't going to. So anyway, I, I just want to I want to bring this up uh, in the case uh, of Josh Allen, uh, because I raised this point in my story off of Sunday's game. And I think we've seen Josh Allen do this for a couple of years now. Well, maybe three or four years. I mean, I but I really started to see him overemphasizing uh, his politicking uh, with officials uh, after a lot of plays. And it's the type of thing that Bills fans used to hate Tom Brady for. It's what people hate LeBron James and Sidney Crosby and Derek Roy used to get whistled for, for diving all the time. Uh, Josh Allen is a, he works the refs and he complains a lot. Uh, sometimes he's just trying to get a 15 yard penalty. Sometimes it's, it seems to be legitimate, uh, uh, because of his style of play, he does take more hits than most quarterbacks. It's reminiscent of Donovan McNabb. Phillies uh, or uh, uh, Philadelphia Eagles fans used to say, "Man, why is this guy not getting more, um, you know, more flags drawn? Uh, or why is he not? Uh, why why aren't defenders penalizing him because he's tucking the ball and running? And he's you know he's doing things to keep plays alive. And you know there have been quarterbacks." Oh, Cam Newton, uh, another big one. Like Cam, how come you didn't throw a flag on that defender for his hit on Cam when you throw that on uh, on a different when, when it happened to a different quarterback? If it happened to Aaron Rodgers, that's a flag. Or if it happens to Tom Brady, it's a flag. Well, Josh Allen seems to be uh, that type of player that we saw from Donovan McNabb, from Cam Newton, that he is now because he runs the ball, because he's willing to take the extra hit. The flag stays in the pocket sometimes because that's what he's doing. That's how he's playing the game. Um, we'll get into, you know, the rightness and wrongness of that, but I guess this is my, uh, my way of setting up the idea that I think that Josh Allen is going to have to pull back on the way he works officials. I think that the roughing the passer penalty late in the game, it was a critical 15 yard penalty and a great break for the bills. That was a flop to me. Uh, Josh Allen was hit and all of a sudden flew his head back, crashed to the ground. It looked like you know, something that you'd see out of uh, um, out of uh, a Duke basketball player um, underneath the hoop, you know, trying to get to trying to draw the charge. And with this heightened awareness of head injuries, I think you could see a situation where Josh Allen says, hey, I just got hit in the head right there. And the ref's going to say, oh, you did? Okay, well, that's 15 yards, but you're going to have to go off the field and get checked out. And now you're gone for a few plays. Or you enter concussion protocol, or the spotter with his binoculars, the guy who couldn't catch it on Cameron Brait says, his head just snapped back right there. Uh, he better come off the field and get checked out. Uh, and I think that this is something that uh, is, is worth watching uh, as we move forward, uh, that Josh Allen – the competitive fire, the right. Yeah. Look at this guy just working the refs, trying to get every break that he can possibly get for his team. I think it's admirable in one sense, uh, but I think it's something that um, it, it bears watching uh, as to whether or not he could overdo it and find himself taken off the field. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, I don't know if it's necessarily going to be Josh Allen, but a quarterback at some point in time will be pretending they got hit in the head when they didn't, when maybe they got hit somewhere else up high just to sell a call and they probably will get spotted by the concussion spotters and removed from the game for some period of time. And we'll probably make fun of them if it's, you know, like Mark Sanchez or some quarterback that has a reputation for doing bonehead things. Well, Mark Sanchez is retired, Jonah. Yeah, but you know what I mean? The new Mark Sanchez, whoever <laughs> right. that is now. But I don't like that Josh Allen does this. I don't think any player should be feigning head injuries at this point in time or feigning head blows that, you know, could potentially be concussions because of it's insensitive to people that have concussions and also people that are sensitive about this issue. And, you know, it's a hot button issue in the NFL right now. And it's just unbecoming for any NFL player to draw more attention to that and possibly, you know, be pretend. I don't want to say pretending, but, you know, feigning, some sort of potentially injurious play because of the yardage and down advantages that it could get. But on the same token, it's a symptom of Josh Allen's star power in the league and the best quarterbacks all do it because it's such a valuable play. If you can get that extra 15 yards and turn oftentimes a bad play an incomplete pass or an interception into a new first down and all of the great quarterbacks are still going to continue to do it. I don't really think there's any way that 
the NFL can put in flopping type rules that the rules are designed to protect the quarterbacks, not to make the quarterbacks, you know, tougher and take, take more hits. So it's never going to go in that direction. So I think quarterbacks are going to continue to do this in different ways. And it's just part of the game. I also don't think it's a great look as a ball player for Josh Allen to be the guy that's stiff arming defenders and leaping over defenders and flexing his muscles when he scores touchdowns. And then they'll be whining about all these faint blows that may or may not even land in the pocket. I mean, I think he has a reputation for taking those two extra steps in bounds before ducking out. Uh, and you're going to, at some point, you're going to get a hit for that because the defender is whistling in to make a, a play and he's not going to let up because Josh Allen is known for waiting until the last possible second to hit, or he's going to lower his shoulder. I mean, if there's uh there's not, not even a, a fakeness aspect of it or the flopping aspect of it is the way he plays uh, that he, and I think that the refs kind of give defenders a little bit of leeway for that. Like they did with Cam Newton, you know, and I think that there are, it's like, Hey, this is the way you play the game. If you don't want to get hit like that, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to slide. Yeah. And I'm certainly not advocating for any defenders to hit Josh Allen or that he's asking for it or anything. Like oh, absolutely that. not. No, no. Um, I don't know. I felt like maybe I didn't make that point clear enough, but I just think if he's going to be the tough guy quarterback on one side of the line of scrimmage, you know, play fair on the other side and don't be so sensitive about hits that aren't really even happening all the time. If you're like the muscle man quarterback that runs linebackers over. Yeah, I agree with that. And for the record, I'll say this. I think that Tom Brady is the greatest player to ever uh, dress in the NFL. And that's not just the greatest quarterback. I think he's the greatest of all time. I personally had no problem with Tom Brady whining to the officials. I don't have any problem with Josh Allen whining to the officials. I think it's kind of part of the game. Um, yeah, it's a, it's unbecoming, like you said, but uh, it's an irritating do, part of the game, especially it is. In baseball and basketball when players do that. And maybe it's I, we don't really hear it as much in football. We see it more than we hear it. But I feel like Josh Allen's been penalized for complaining to the refs. He's gotten flags. I'm thinking last year or w- w- uh, two years ago. Yeah, but right. He's and gotten. He's actually been flagged for you know getting after a ref for not making a call. And you can get distracted from what your real job is, you know, playing the game and throwing the football. If you're a little too worried about working the refs, that happens in basketball a lot. Play the game. The refs. If you get hit late, the refs are going to call it, especially if you're a star quarterback in the NFL. What are your uh, What are your thoughts here on what What you think is on what will happen uh, in the NFL as somebody who's been an observer of professional sports and the NFL in particular, how much of a swing or how dramatic do you think things change in terms of the way the NFL addresses these head injuries? Is it going to be noticeable if, a month from now, Jonah, are we going to see heightened awareness to where guys are taken off the field for extra precaution? Um, are we going to, what are we going to see? Because the, the reason I think it's going to be noticeable is because you had a PR crisis with Tua Tagovailoa about health and safety. Uh, You have the league uh, being criticized internationally for allowing this to happen. And then the league and the NFL Players Association, I don't just want to say the NFL because this is a jointly uh, bargained thing between the Players Union and the league, admitting that the, the protocols don't work as cleanly as that they would like them to work or that they should work. So I think just even for optics, the NFL is going to make a concerted effort to show how much more vigilant they are with head injuries. And I think if that means guys who normally wouldn't be taken off the field or guys who shouldn't, you know, maybe you have a stinger or a a different type of injury, or it looked like it could be something and it really turned out they're going to be taken off the field. I think that the, there's going to be an abundance of caution uh, to, uh, to swing that that pendulum back as far the other way as they can to where it is now after seeing Tua Tagovailoa taken off the field uh, on a stretcher. Well, you've done a lot more reporting on this, and you cover the NFL much closer than I do, and I think you summed it up pretty well there. But I agree absolutely that there is going to be an overcorrection, and maybe rightly so. And I kind of thought this was already the way it was done. Sort of seemed like, the overcorrection happened a few years back and that now there were maybe plays where players wouldn't have been pulled from games before and they're out at all levels. You see this in college and high school games too, 
where a player is upset that he's not allowed back in the game because he's been pulled by the concussion spotters. That's just part of the game now. I'm a little surprised that we're going through a situation. That's why maybe I was, you know, flat-footed in the way we reacted to Tua last week when I gave the NFL the benefit of the doubt and didn't think there was some grand conspiracy, but I do think maybe mistakes were made. And because I thought the NFL was already handling concussions the right way and with extra care, and if we're going to err, we're going to err on the side of pulling a healthy player out of the game and not letting a player with a concussion continue to play. So I absolutely think at least there should be and there will be much more stringent following of the policies that were already in place and strengthening of the policies. And, uh, you know, independent neurologists probably won't make mistakes for a while now. If, you know, if they know what's good for them and if the NFL knows what's good for them from a public relations standpoint, they hope no player gets another concussion and they certainly hope no player with a concussion continues to play in a game at least so soon after it happened once before. I think that um, at least, and I don't, I don't really know if there was a specific instance. Uh, it was already after the WBC had uh, trimmed championship fights from 15 rounds to 12 uh, because they were just trying to make the fights that much safer. Uh, but I do remember a time when I was covering boxing a lot from say 95 to 2005 when there was a movement to end fights sooner and the fans eventually got on board with it, you know, boxing is a bloodthirsty sport. You watch it for, uh, to see a guy get knocked silly in some ways. Yes. There's the art and the defense and the punches and bunches and, and things like that. But you know, the TKO, you know, the guy who's out on his feet and the ref needs to come in and wave up while holding the guy up his arm. They actually train the refs on how to hold a guy up while ending the fight you know, waving it off. You got the arm under the guy's armpit. You're hugging him to make sure he doesn't hit the canvas again. You're waving off the fight. And what's he doing? He's arguing at the ref that he wants to keep going, uh, which is, again, this is a little bit of a tangent, but there are a lot of people out there who say to a tag of Aloha should be on the hook and players should be on the hook for protecting themselves. You can't expect a competitor who has just suffered brain damage, uh, which is what a concussion is, uh, somebody who's out on their feet, not thinking clearly to do what's best for him and his brain. So I just think that that's my retort to people who say that the athlete needs to be the most responsible is the image of that boxer who can't stand, who is saying he wants to continue, uh, that he deserves uh, for the fight to continue. Uh, but anyways, uh, tangent over. But there was a point uh, during my hard core decade of covering uh, boxing where the fights were being ended earlier um, with a, an abundance of caution before the guy uh, went down uh, while he was taking too many shots. And then there was the fan pushback of let the guy fight. Um, and then eventually people were like, you know what, let's, let's actually be safer. You know, maybe the guy could have continued to fight, but his eyes were rolling back in his head. Uh, and uh, maybe if given 30 seconds to dance around the ring a little bit, would have been able to clear the uh, metaphoric cobwebs and shake it off and come back in a dramatic fashion and win an instant classic. Uh, yeah, that's true. Those could happen. Uh, but it seemed as though uh, there was there was this um, this movement that it is OK to stop a fight too soon instead of stopping it too late. Uh, and I think that's kind of been baked into combat sports in the last 10, 15 years. And I would like to see football fans also get to that point. And I think they have seriously shifted. We talked about this last week, Jonah, on the podcast where, you know, you used to be able to, you know, or you used to find yourself maybe leaping out of your seat a little bit after a big hit, where, as opposed to wincing and, and sinking back and thinking, man, I don't want to see that replay. Um, I think that more football fans are thinking that way. Um, yet, uh, I do think that there's still this belief that, um, let these guys play. They know them. This is what they signed up for. You see that sentiment a lot on social media. They know what they're getting into roll them back out there. And if that's my team's best chance to win, then put Tua back out there. I don't give a shit. Uh, and hopefully we can, we can keep moving away from that mentality and towards, all right. Uh, maybe it was a back injury, 
We're going to take a look at this again tomorrow morning, Tua. But right now, you're not going back into the game. And I think that that's the common sense approach. And I think that uh, if you were to ask most football fans, whether they're Dolphins uh, faithful or not, would look back and say that's what should have happened. Unless you're Merrill Hodge. Have you ever read any of his books? No, no, I'm aware. Uh, no, I haven't read the books, but I'm, I'm aware of his, uh, his stance uh, on, on this, uh, that uh, CTE is essentially, uh, it, it, he thinks it's a fallacy. It's like an anti-vaxxer, concussion and that. Yeah. Um, yeah, CTE, you just see these lingering effects and, uh, and what it does to people. Uh, later in life, it doesn't even necessarily have to be how two is feeling right now. Uh, it could be how two is feeling in the year 2027. Um, we saw it with, we've seen it with so many people and, uh, they, who, people who take their lives, people who, uh, whose families fall apart, they drink too much. Uh, they abuse their families. Uh, they, uh, the mood swings, they think about killing themselves. They do reckless things. Um, they go broke, uh, because they can't make proper decisions. Uh, we saw Rodney Harrison, who was known during his time as the dirtiest player in the NFL was expressing his regret at the way he played the game and his resentment towards the NFL for allowing that type of, of, of game to be played, uh, because of all the damage and the carnage that results uh, over time, not just on that field in that moment within those 60 minutes, but with broken lives. Um, I wrote about that with Daryl Talley and he's uh, a, a success story because he's still alive and he's been able to, and his family has been able to kind of put their lives back together. But for a period there, he wanted to be dead and he was totally broke and living off of the grace and charity of his former teammates who uh, we're paying his rent. He'd lost his house. He'd lost his children's college tuition or their college funds because he was trying to keep his business afloat, uh, but he wasn't thinking straight. So he was emptying out all his accounts to try to save a business that that wasn't going to succeed anyway. And you, you got to imagine a guy who's thinking about killing himself is probably not making the sound the the, the most sound financial decisions uh, for his his wife and children or for his business. Um, and uh, a lot of that is chalked up to the abuse that his brain took on Sunday afternoons. He was a hero. You're a hero. You're on the wall of fame. All these things that go into being a warrior, maybe the greatest warrior in Bill's history and all the things that got fans excited on a weekly basis, on a game to game basis, ruined his life. And I think more and more athletes are keen to that, but I still think it's difficult and we see it all the time to convince that warrior athlete or that just even a competitor, Hey, you need to come out of this game and you need to sit for a couple of weeks. And they say, fuck you. I'm not put me back out there. And sometimes they get their way. Yeah. I just thought it was, this was supposed to be like a bygone era of football or from a bygone era, almost like steroids in baseball. We thought we had it figured out in the concussion protocol and everything like that, that some of the same patterns and mistakes weren't going to be repeated anymore. You can't get concussions out of the game, but it seemed like the reaction to concussions or potential head injuries from blows to the head were taken more seriously and properly. And we learned, we've seen all sorts of athletes be pulled from games and from seasons, not play for weeks and weeks at a time and have multiple concussions and be clear to come back. It's like they seem to have figured out the science and slipped through the cracks this time with Tua. I don't know if that's just an isolated incident or a symptom of a larger problem, but, you know, I thought that it wasn't going to happen as much anymore in the NFL. It's still a major issue. Yeah, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens here in the next week or so with the NFL. I expect something uh, sweeping and uh, and substantial. Um, just quickly to note, just because it's on my head, I don't I don't necessarily need to make it a topic, but you know the NHL uh, was considered at the forefront of concussion treatment uh, following what happened with Pat Lafontaine 
and all the different concussion protocols that were put in and other sports have copied what the NHL has done with concussions. I still find it interesting though, that commissioner Gary Bettman refuses to acknowledge the link between concussions and CTE. Uh, and, uh, this is the commissioner of the number two collision sport in the world. Um, well, number two, I guess, can, I don't know. Maybe it's number one because of the speed that these guys are playing at. The fact that the rank, well, I don't know. What, what does the data say? I, and I should say team sport because tell you what, I don't know part, of the, part of the purpose I, of combat sport is to cause a concussion. But go ahead. I just think, I, I don't know if this is the number one, but I think I read that soccer has one of the biggest oh, because of all the headers. of any sport. Well, they don't wear any headgear and the headers. And I think there's some plays with falling on the ground and, and it's not so much hitting the ball with your head, as I understand, although that maybe that's a problem too. But they hit each other, or they hit arms and shoulders. On yeah, you're going up for you go up yeah. to head the ball with, along with somebody else, and yeah, that's true. And even falling on the ground after some of these plays, like the aerial plays, are very concussive, if you will. And I think I read that I don't know per capita, per goal, per scoring point, there's more concussions in soccer than any other sport. Yes. Well, I was talking about collisions of bodies coming together. And I think that you don't have that as much in soccer, but yes, you do have maybe more repeated head trauma in soccer because of that. Um, then, you know, micro concussions and things of that nature, um, and prolonged exposure to that creates serious issues throughout life. Uh, Jonah, thanks for this. Um, I'll get this uh, posted this evening. This is a rare uh, late night uh, podcast that we're doing here. Uh, Aaron Judge conceivably could have hit another home run because the Yankees were still playing. Maybe he does have 63 by now, but um, well, he does have some of these steroids that I'm taking for my home run swing are going to give me insomnia. So if you want to do like a middle of the night podcast tomorrow, I'll be up with nothing to do. Okay. That sounds good. Jonah, as always, my appreciation to you and to the good folks at New Bronstein Times. I am Tim Graham from The Athletic. Thank you for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs, and business consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations, and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.